Anyway, so we move on with the program, and I'm happy to introduce the first speaker. Um, I think of him as a, really like a son I never had. Uh, Ryan is, how do I say, Ryan is a magician in, in so many ways. So he's uh, an awesome paddler, but that's a given. All of us are. Um, he's, uh, <laughs> he's a musician. He's a cook. He knows how to make um, maple syrup. He knows how to make uh, Sokolova, which is a Serbian version of plum brandy. He knows everything there is to know how he packed that in his, whatever, 20 years. He drove on a bicycle from Montreal to Palmer Rapids, maybe, Ernie, how many years ago? Six, seven or eight? And he never left. So you, you, can, <laughs> you can see him around, uh, obviously, Madawaska and Peddler Cop. He will be running Peddler Cop this year. And uh, anyway, we were fortunate to be on a few trips together. So without any further ado, I'll give you Ryan O'Connor. Uh, Alex, thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thanks everybody for, uh, for participating in this event and hosting such a great venue to hear so many great stories. Uh, I came for the first time last year and it was really remarkable and it's, it's an absolute honor to be presenting. So my name's Ryan. Um, I'm going to be talking about a river trip that we did actually a number of years ago. And the reason that uh, it's not something more relevant or more recent, I suppose, is because the Magpie is a river that not too many people get the opportunity to, to actually go down, but it's such a unique and beautiful um, environment and whitewater section of river uh, that I think it's worth sharing. So throughout the course of my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of like the region and the reasons that we went to the Magpie. Uh, give you a little bit of history, kind of like farther reaching history and the more modern history, uh, talk about our trip, and then also talk about some kind of environmental protection um, with regards to this river. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to start off with a little bit of history and some context surrounding the Magpie. So the Magpie is located on the north shore of the St. Lawrence Gulf. Uh, it flows out of a few hundred kilometers south of Labrador City on the Labrador Plains. And the North Shore of Quebec is just a beautiful region where mountains and rivers meet expansive oceanfront vistas. Um, and it's located in, or the region that we went is circled there a little bit on the kind of bottom right hand corner of, uh, of our map. So it's actually part of the Equinichit region, which uh, is known by the uh, kind of more common name of Mingan, the town of Mingan, Quebec. Um, and boom, we've got like these beautiful vistas. This is just an example of uh, the um, mouth of the Saguenay River on our way up to the Magpie. So this is uh, just a, a glimpse of some of the beautiful terrain that we got to cross on our way there. So... Nice. Musikao Shipu. I apologize if I'm not saying that correctly, but that's the, the indigenous term for the magpie. Um, so we had a beautiful land acknowledgement uh, earlier provided by Erica. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's, it's amazing how far back we, we tend to limit our vision, but it's, it's quite significant to be kind of reaching farther back than the more modern history. So I did a little bit of research regarding the magpie, and this is all after the fact that I learned about this. But uh, essentially, the Equinichit First Nation, uh, or sorry, the Equinichit region is in Mingan, Quebec, and it is part of the Innu First Nation. They call the area Nitasinan, which means their land. Um, so they were traditionally hunter-gatherer people who populated this area for many, many, many centuries, basically since before memory can, can recall. They spent their summers on the coast and their winter in the bush, uh, again, with that kind of like ocean and river meeting place. It's a really rich environment and proved favorable for many years for them. So Muhutikau Shipu essentially means where the river passes between square rocky cliffs. So you'll see in a little bit 
um, some of the gorgeous scenery that the magpie has. So why do we choose the magpie? Well, the magpie is not only beautiful and remote, it offers awesome fishing. It's really remote in the sense of once you're out there, you feel like there's absolutely nobody around for miles and miles, but you can drive right to the takeout, which is kind of crazy. Um, we took a float plane in, so there's only one flight that kind of needs to be arranged, or, or one part of the shuttle that needs to be arranged. It doesn't have very many portages. Um, there's a couple large ones at the bottom, but most of the, of the more major rapids are kind of carryovers for rafts, um, and actually achievable in a, in a whitewater kayak or for certain canoeists. It's got a lot of class two to three and four runnable whitewater with some fives in there. It's been rated as National Geographic's one of their top 10 whitewater river trip um, destinations, which is pretty major. It was also, at the time that we were going, under threat of a, of a pretty significant hydro development project. So the Magpie is only a few rivers sort of over in the watershed region of eastern Quebec from the Romaine, which has a very large complex on it, and it seemed to be kind of low-hanging fruit for hydro development projects. I'll get a little bit into that later, but the good news is uh, it's got much more significant protection and support now than it did at the time that we were doing this trip. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some kind of more modern tripping history. Naturally, the Equinichit folks were on the land for many, many years and would be using these waterways. Um, but kind of like more recently, bringing it into the context of the sort of tripping that folks like us would be doing, um, it was run by private groups for a number of decades now. Folks would either take the train up to the west branch of the Magpie, uh, which is a tributary, and paddle in down there. Although it presented some challenges because it was kind of class four and class five, very challenging whitewater before you get to the more reasonable stuff. But the first rafting expedition uh, was done by Eric Hertz in 1988. Uh, who runs an outfit called Earth River Expeditions. Eric also kind of spearheaded putting the magpie on the map um, and in large part can be credited for the reasons that we were aware of it. And so he did a lot of advocacy work kind of in the early years when the threat of a hydro project uh, was quite real and relevant. He brought people together such as uh, media outlets and celebrities, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to name one, uh, to just raise awareness about this river and about how beautiful it was. Uh, since Earth River started running trips, there's one other commercial outfitter, Boreal River, that runs trips on the Magpie as well. Um, I'm not too sure about Earth River's kind of current state of affairs, how they're if they're still running trips on the Magpie or not. I'd reached out but hadn't gotten a response. But I do know if you're looking to go with a commercial outfit, uh, Boreal River does that uh, at least a number of trips a year. So we ended up contacting... I believe Alex was our trip leader and ended up contacting Danny Pellid from Boreal uh, for lots of information. He's been super helpful for that. And yeah, why me? Good question. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like a deer in the headlights sort of thing there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, maybe I'm asking myself that question. <laughs> Try to write out and find the answer. So I was, um, as Alex mentioned, I was working at Paddler Co-op. Um, I cycled there because that was the, the easiest way for me to get there and uh, the most affordable. And I, I kind of got a taste of the, the river life or the, or the life of the river gods that I respected and, um, and looked up to. And as soon as I, I got a taste of that, I needed to pursue it. So I spent a summer working at Pather Co-op, which is a whitewater canoe and kayak school in Palmer Rapids. Um, I was quickly introduced to Alex Gusev uh, through Ernie Coolis and a number of other friends in the, in the Madawaska Valley. And uh, maybe they took pity on me. Maybe they actually needed my French speaking skills to be their liaison when they got into trouble and broke a trailer at the takeout. Um, but uh, it was a great opportunity for me to just expand my horizons, do a first kind of major river trip, and for that I'm forever grateful. So now I'm going to get into a little bit about the trip itself. Um, throughout this I've got a number of photos, some of these have quotes on them from my river log uh, from the journey, um, and then others are just kind of like some of the great vistas that we got to see. So this photo is actually from when we were on our way to the Magpie. So we drove from Palmer Rapids, uh, it was about 1,500 kilometers, and stopped at a number of spots. And this spot just captivated me. Um, I have a pretty vivid journal entry regarding it, and you can read it up there. The drive starts winding through tall hills and around big cliffs, 
at times still hugging the shore so strongly to create this ultimate feeling of wonder, freedom, and mystery that lies beyond. Um, and at the end of a, an already kind of mind-opening season for me, uh, my, my horizons continued to, to expand endlessly, it seemed. So we left Palmer Rapids, drove 1,500 kilometers along the north shore of the St. Lawrence River to the town of Havre St. Pierre. It's about 60 kilometers from the end of the summer road, so it's pretty well as far as you can go up there. Uh, but it's basically just one highway once you're out of Montreal. Uh, the trip itself, 230 kilometers of river travel. Most of it is white water. There's some flat water sections in there. Um, we had three float plane trips to get our gear in there. Nine paddlers, uh, two kayaks, and two rafts. A lot of the folks that you'll see in this presentation, you might recognize from the volunteer tables and the people kicking around. So, essentially, once we got to Havre Saint Pierre, we loaded up our gear into a float plane by Labrador Air Safari. We had three trips to get up to the river. This is just an example of us on our plane getting ready to go. Uh, and by the time we got to the river, the sun was shining and the days were beautiful. So we landed on Lake Magpot, which is a massive lake. Uh, it's something like 30 plus kilometers long. Had a little bit of a flat water section, and then as soon as we were at the kind of the mouth of the river out of Lake Magpie, it was game on. So our first night was just as we started getting into the white water, and the best part about it was not only the view from the Groover, but one by one, we were catching endless speckled trout. And I'm not much of a fisherman by any means, uh, but for whatever reason, when that rod got in my hands, I was just pulling one out after another, and it seemed that that happened to anybody. So one of the great things about it is that we had lots of fresh fish, lots of fresh food, uh, and the trip was already underway for an amazing experience. Come morning number two, spirits were bright, and we were excited. Uh, this is Peja, one of the one of the other folks on the trip. And the thing that I found the most remarkable uh, about uh, experiencing, I guess maybe Serbian culture and, uh, and Serbian river culture is that <laughs> no, ma no matter what happens, there's a cause for a celebration. And, <laughs> and I thought I had been through the gauntlet of, of, of being a young man in a big city and, and, and partying and having fun with friends and enjoying ourselves and indulging a little bit, but I, I'd never drank plum brandy at 6.30 in the morning before. <laughs> but they did it, and we did it, and it was great. So uh, our first morning was, uh, was started off just awesome. And uh, of course, it takes a little bit of time for the young guys to limber up and catch up with the older folks, but we, we were doing what we could. So this is my cousin Joe Coolis and, my, and myself. Uh, we were the two kayakers on the trip. There were two rafts that were kind of like gear and paddle rafts uh, included. And we were sort of like the, the probes sentinels for kind of scouting some of the rapids um, and using our walkie-talkies until I lost my walkie-talkie and then we couldn't communicate with them. But uh, we were, yeah, we were kind of like the, uh, the young guns in and amongst some of the more seasoned folks. So... <laughs> You might recognize Harry and Romilo from the, uh, from the book tables earlier today. They were just part of an entire group of folk who um, made me realize that there's an appreciation that we can share for nature and for these wilderness environments, no matter what our age, no matter what our demographic, um, no matter where we come from or, or what our history tells about us. Uh, and it was really remarkable that the large group of us, as diverse as it was, was able to um, connect on such a fundamental level. Um, and so I'm probably just going to give a shout out to everybody as, as their faces come up on here, but it was, really, it was really incredible. So day one, we started scouting. We had some class two rapids, class two plus three rapids. Uh, and then by lunchtime, we started to get to one of the major, more major rapids. So we kind of sprawled for a little bit of a picnic, had some gorgeous sunny weather. Um, it was really nice, and while we were here, of course, because we had our kayaks, it was a great opportunity for us to try out some, uh, some bigger rapids. So even though this might have been a little bit of a carryover, couldn't resist lining it up and going for a little bit of a run. Um, so we had a couple larger uh, rapids this day, and then mixed in with a number of sort of smaller, more simple rapids. Uh, it made for a good mixture of excitement and adrenaline, but also kind of calm and enjoyable activity. And by the end of the day, 
the tunes came out, the food was had, and before you knew it, you were asleep in your chair. So that, <laughs> this is, my, my dad uh, always told me this quote, a good soldier sleeps when he can, and um, I, I think it came from like a military kind of background, obviously, but uh, I, I kind of embody that. I, I, tend to, I tend to run a little bit high, high test, and uh, at a certain point, I'll just hit a wall, and if I'm if I'm sitting, standing, or doing anything, and it's time for me to shut down, my eyes will be open, and uh, <laughs> the, the lights will be on, but nobody will be home. And that's one of the best things about a river trip, is that no matter where you are, if there's nothing going on, like a big rapid or anything like that, then it's time to, it's time to sit down and enjoy the day. So after a few days of uh, kind of more calm rapids and uh, simple sort of river travel in and amongst these large hills, we got to uh, another larger rapid. This is actually the campsite below one of the large rapids. Um, and the reason that I'm kind of just calling them generic names is that the Magpie is a river that's not that commonly run and not that commonly, um, I guess, written up about. So it's, it's more so of like a, a verbal, like an oral um, culture and understanding of the river itself rather than uh, any actual formal literature on it. And the, if any formal literature is, is out there, it's simply for like policy and procedural purposes from either Boreal River or Earth River. Um, so I think this, this rapid might have been called Porcupine. It was, a, uh, it was a carryover on river left and a larger falls. But I think the only reason it's called Porcupine is because somebody saw a porcupine there, and that's what they referred to the rapid as. <laughs> So we had our, our fair share of larger stuff that we had to get down, but the best part about the Magpie, as I was saying earlier, is that it's one of those rivers that you don't really need to portage too much. So the good thing about these rapids is that there were easy trails for us to just carry the gear down, and then, of course, we could take the dry line with the rafts. <laughs> so there were a few little hang-ups, and maybe there was a couple swear words exchanged about the fact that this catamaran that joined the trip had too low hanging of a net that tended to get caught on just about every rock in the river. But it was a great opportunity for us to practice our, our river rescue and rope management skills. Um, and needless to say, it all worked out in the end and nobody got hurt, which is awesome. So this is just an example of the portage. Super great um, because it's, it's just a carryover over rocks. There's no kind of complicated trail or anything like that. And this was sort of typical for the first seven days of our trip. It was a nine day long trip. Uh, and at the very end, as I mentioned earlier, is where the, the, the real major falls and rapids are, uh, which are beautiful, but unfortunately require a portage. Uh, but the best part about the, uh, the sections kind of upstream is that all we had to do was just carry over a little bit of land uh, and then send the boats down or line the boats down or run them down empty, which made it really convenient and easy. So this is our third campsite, or sorry, pardon me, our fourth campsite. Um, and the view from here was just spectacular. As you can tell, you can kind of see where the Magpie gets its name from, where the river passes between square rocky cliffs. These sort of large mountainous vistas and black spruce forests were super kind of typical and picturesque, I guess, of the environment that we were traveling in. So our fourth large rapid uh, was once again just before the end of the day. Um, I wrote this down as double drop in my journal, uh, just because it's a large drop at the top and then a, a nice section below. But it was just unbelievable with every horizon that we would kind of come up upon, uh, and then once you get out on the rocks on the shoreline to scout, it just presented picture-perfect, almost postcard opportunities of, of just total remote wilderness. Um, and the fact that we saw nobody on the river and, and were essentially carving campsites out of shorelines at times or trying to find rocky shoals kind of gives it this sort of remote and, and rugged and... Um, really really wilderness and uncommercialized feeling. But once again, the accessibility and the, the potential to just have your vehicle at the bottom and only need to have one flight to get to the top makes it actually really functional and practical to access these incredible wilderness environments. So naturally, as kayakers, we do what we do best and we try and find white water and go down it. So as uh, Joe and myself were trying to pick lines down here as the other folks were carrying the rafts downstream or lining them across the big portages. 
And then by the end of that evening, with any trip that happens, it seems there's always going to be a frosty morning that comes up. So I remember this being kind of one of those mornings when I regrettably had to pull on my wet layers and tell myself that everything was going to be okay, but I really didn't think everything was going to be okay. <laughs> and since then, I had, I had told myself that I would never expose myself to needing to go through that discomfort of putting on your wet clothes one day after the other. Um, and eight years later, here I am still doing this, probably 200 days a year. So I don't know what it is. It's one of those things where your mind checks out and you just do what you have to do. You wake up in the morning, you kind of get the crinkles out of your dry suit or out of your neoprene or whatever and put it on and it's cold for a few minutes. But then next thing you know, you're rewarded with some pretty spectacular views of wilderness and realize that, yeah, I'm a little bit uncomfortable, but things are pretty good. So by day seven, we had made our way down about three quarters of the river to the gorge. So the gorge is kind of like the, the, the feature point of the river in terms of just unbelievable views, spectacular looking white water. Uh, and this photo was taken actually on top of a cliff where we had basically set up kind of like our um, not campsite, but like cooking area and eating area, just because it was such a gorgeous view. We were about 300 feet up and could hear the thunder of the falls. Um, and there was a few moments of sunshine in there that we, we really enjoyed. So naturally, with any large rapid comes a large portage. So we had a 900 meter portage here. And in order to pull this off, unfortunately, we had to kind of disassemble the rafts and, um, and bring them down with us uh, one bit at a time, but that's okay. We had a layover day there, which actually worked out really well for not being too stressed and, and getting all the gear down. Um, more commercial outfits will do uh, like a helicopter shuttle out of there or a um, yeah helicopter gear pickup. And then they'll, they'll just kind of paddle the empty rafts further downstream just because it's less than a day's paddle to get to the very bottom of the river. Uh, but one photo that I did want to include was how we had to get a little bit creative with some of our campsites. <laughs> Uh, this wasn't uncommon, but uh, it was great, you know, like when you look back on those, on those hilarious spots where you find a way to pitch a tent in, a, in a, a place that you can call home, you kind of think more fondly, I think, on those than, than just the easy, accessible campsites. The best thing that I remember about this evening was that we were sitting on about maybe 16 inches of caribou moss which when you first get there is like memory foam. It's just remarkable. I kind of feel bad maybe for the next group that was coming through if they were there after us. They wouldn't get that experience, but it was really awesome. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the trip, but of course we had smiling faces. And one thing that I just wanted to mention is that um, the hard work, the dedication, the logistics, the planning, and that just remarkable, cool, calm, collected, smiling, encouraging attitude that only a Serbian with the name Alex Gusev can have. It was just exuded all the time. It, it's, it's truly incredible. And the fact that we're even just here collected talking about it speaks to that. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment, Alex, to say thank you so very much. Um, for all the mentorship, the guidance, um, the, the logistics and support, and the Soklova over the years. <laughs> so we're doing our last portage. This is Velia. He is another person who's been, uh, I think, around the, the Wilderness and Canoe Symposium, but also uh, participating in these trips. He um, always had the sharpest knife. Remi <laughs> reminded me to be careful to not cut myself. And uh, yeah, since, since trying some of his knives, I've, I've grown an appreciation for not just hacking on a, on a dull piece of steel. And then, of course, we have Hari and Peja taking time while the boss is away to enjoy themselves on the, on the portage trail. And lastly, we have the, the deadly combination of Ernie and Alex, who have um, gone on a number of, number of trips and, and formed quite a partnership in, and friendship in the last, geez, I don't know, decade or so, maybe even more. Um, and it's a, it's a large part of the, the two of their uh, collective attitudes, welcoming natures, hospitality, um, and, and every, everything else that's been mentioned and can be mentioned that uh, I had the great opportunity to go on this trip. So I'm really grateful, Ernie, and I'm really grateful, Alex, for everything 
that, uh, that you've done and been able to show me. Coming down by the very end, we have Magpie Falls. So this is below the gorge, so it's an epic waterfall. It's obviously unrunnable, but it's just this beautiful vista with this rock point that you can stand out on and just feel by the time you have transcended on a trip that you are in a state of sublime and one with nature. And it's really a spectacular way to kind of cap off an experience and a great point to just pause for reflection. This was our last rapid. Um, and I uh, left there with a big smile on my face. <laughs> How could I not? Um, so essentially, this is, this is more or less the end of our trip. We had a few kilometers paddle out from the bottom to what is now an impoundment for a dam at the very base of the Magpie. But I do want to touch just a moment on the kind of environmental protection and conservancy efforts that's going on. So as I mentioned, as early as in the 90s, there was a proposed mega project on the Magpie River. Unfortunately, the first battle got lost, and so there is a dam at the bottom, so you can no longer paddle out to the ocean um, on this river. However, with the efforts of Eric Hertz with Earth River, uh, SNAP, which is an organization in Quebec called the Société de la Nature et des Parcs, so essentially the Society for Nature and Parks, um, had a petition, raised funds, did an enormous media campaign uh, and lobby campaign to um, dissuade the government from uh, allowing the Hydro-Quebec Six Dam project to, to go on, uh, which ultimately led to the ability for this river to continue to be run. Um, there's... There's too many people and stakeholders to be able to mention for the fact that this river is still flowing freely, but I think it speaks to the fact that if we get together collectively, uh, share these experiences in venues like this, contact media, produce content, um, talk in the eddies to folks that we know, there is a chance that we can make a difference and we can preserve some of these incredible environments for us. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about that, there is still an ongoing petition. Who knows, uh, the legislation might change over or there might be an opportunity for a new strategic plan uh, in about five years' time that Hydro-Quebec might put this back on their list. Um, but the Société de la Nature et des Parcs, snapquebec.org, is a good resource to be able to kind of understand a little bit about the conservancy efforts that have gone on on the Magpie. And that's about it, folks. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>